Welcome everyone, I am Ade Shewa Josh and this is Africa Matters. This week we go to Malawi, Kenya and Uganda and explore how the continent is dealing with the devastating impact of climate change. We follow the deadly trail of tropical cyclone Freddy, which is on track to set the record for being the most powerful and long-lasting storm ever recorded in the Southern Hemisphere. People in Mozambique, Madagascar and Malawi are counting their losses from the storm, which has killed hundreds of people and left thousands homeless. Cyclone Freddy developed on February 6th off the coast of Australia and traveled thousands of miles across the South Indian Ocean to make landfall in Mananjari town, southeast of Madagascar on February 21st. The United Nations says at least more than a dozen people have died as the region continues to battle strong winds and torrential rains. Uh, some of the deaths were caused by the collapse of their houses, while others uh, were due to droning. More than 5,000 houses were destroyed, and 16,000 persons have been displaced when the construction of their house is currently ongoing. In addition, three national roads and uh, dozens of uh, local roads were cut, and the government must take charge of the restoring traffic. This is essential for the supply of products and for the continuity of trades in these regions. These roads were already in poor condition before the cyclone. Three days after passing through Madagascar, Cyclone Freddy made landfall in Mozambique twice on February 24th and March 11th. It hit the provinces of Inhambe and Zambezia with strong winds and rains, killing dozens of people and displacing nearly 30,000 others, according to the UN. Seven out of 10 provinces are affected. And at the same time, uh, there is a cholera outbreak that is compounding. Uh, the, the climate events are, um, are very strong and extremely protracted, very anomalous, and they are a classic uh, expression of climate change. And they have brought widespread devastation and widespread floodings. The flooding is still ongoing. The rains are still ongoing. The rains are, I mean, it rains in a week, but normally it rains in six months and during a rain season. Uh, so people have uh, lost their harvest, people have lost their housing, uh, people are in shelters uh, because Mozambique has invested a lot in early warning systems. Mozambique managed uh, to avoid loss of life. Uh, uh, there is only a minimal loss of life compared to four years ago when uh, a huge cyclone Idai uh, struck. On March 12th, Cyclone Freddy barreled through neighboring Malawi's southern region all the way to the second largest city, Blantyre. Malawi's president, Lazarus Chakwera, has declared a state of disaster in that region as rescue and search teams continue to hunt for survivors. Lamek Masina tells us more from the capital, Lilongwe. Uh, the people here say they are lacking a lot of, a lot of assistance, like uh, they need the food, they need the clothes and the clean water. And uh, they say the aid is not forthcoming because, uh, for example, uh, some days they spend without even taking anything. And, for example, they say yesterday uh, most of them spend without getting food. We need to bathe, but we are lacking soap, clothes and food. We came here without anything. As you know, during disasters, no one can carry any belongings. We just saved our lives. So there are a lot of problems here. We are lacking assistance here, and it seems a lot of assistance is going to women, maybe because they have babies. But us men, we are receiving nothing. For example, men are sleeping without blankets here. The UN Children Agency, UNICEF, says it is doing everything needed to assist those in need, especially children. First of all, we are providing the wash uh, facilities. As you have seen, we're bringing in chlorine, and buckets for the people that are staying in the camp so that at least there is hygiene and to contain the cholera. But also, we're also looking at uh, health, assessing the health of the children in the camps. But also, we want to make sure that there's continuation of education. And most of all, we're also looking at um, child protection. So we're looking at health, uh, child protection, um, wash, nutrition, as well as um, education. But at the moment, government says it is doing anything uh, to assist the needy uh, who have been displaced here. For example, the state president said this week that the government has released 1.6 million US dollars uh, to cater for the needs. Let's hear more from Richard Munang, who is the deputy director of the UN Environment Programme in Africa. He joins me from Nairobi, Kenya. Thank you so much for joining us. 
What makes Cyclone Freddy an exceptional tropical storm? And are we likely to see more of such rare phenomenon? Thank you very much for having me. And let me, first of all, start by expressing uh, condolences to the people of Malawi, Mozambique, and Madagascar that have actually suffered not just loss of lives, but a lot of property and a lot of assets in these countries. And the reality is that this, if you take Malawi, where the southern part of the country have been hit in a very bad way, this is the second time in one month that Malawi is suffering this. And Southern African region is seeing these cyclones the second time in less than two months. And when you put this within the perspective of the science that we do have today, in 2022, December, the United Nations Environment Program published the emissions gap report, which shows that if the policies that the world have put together on climate change were implemented, we are going to reach 2.8 degrees. And the reality of this is already been felt in the continent because one degree warming result to 7% of precipitation. And in Southern Africa region, which warming twice as fast as the rest of the world, the reality of the impacts comes through cyclones and mm -hmm. flooding and heavy rains as we have seen. Well, Malawi has the highest casualty out of the three countries where Freddie made landfall. Why do you think that is? The, the reality, there's really no country in the world that is immune to disasters and especially to cyclones and hurricanes. And when you take the case of Malawi, uh, including Madagascar and, and Mozambique, the entire African continent actually infrastructure is fragile preparation is not optimal. Why? Because as we're speaking today, over 840 million Africans don't have access to early warning systems. Only about 40% of the continent do have that. And without having early warning system, it is diff difficult to be able to put plans in place to shift people from vulnerable sites and actually prepare response mechanisms. And therefore it becomes very, very important that early warning systems, automatic weather stations, actually get to become not just the norm, but at the same time get installed in every community so that people can be forewarned in cases of disasters like this so that it can be relocated and also relieve an emergency response actually beefed up. Mr. Munang, you know, sometimes early warning systems, especially in communities that rely on the resources of the sea, coastal communities, which in this case have been very affected, they rely on the resources of the sea. So when you tell them to evacuate, which is what early warning systems often translate to in many parts of Africa, what you're telling them is to, um, to forego their livelihood. How do you address that? Because that's usually why most people don't leave when early warning comes. That's a very important question. I think it's touching an aspect that sometimes gets forgotten when these aspects of emergency response are needed. That means we need to look not just at the immediate, we need to look at the medium and long term. And we are looking at the long term, this one word socioeconomic comes in, because as we rightly put it, people in communities do not only belong there, they grew up there, they have their assets there, it's part and parcel of them. And therefore, the socioeconomic dimension comes in, because even if you were to give early warning signals to a family to relocate, if they don't have the resources, mm. they will not be able to do so. And therefore, looking at how we can be able to empower, socioeconomically empower these communities with solutions that help them put more money in their pockets and food on the table, then that will prepare them to diversify and can easily move out of harm's way when that information from early warning system is brought to them. So what needs to be done is three things. Firstly, when you look at the entire African continent, including Malawi, Mozambique, and Madagascar, they have their climate action plans. And most of them focus actually in the area of agriculture and clean energy. It therefore means that the decentralization of solutions, for example, like a solar dryer to a community in southern Malawi, yeah. could actually see a more dry her vegetables, dry her tomatoes. And as a result of that, will not suffer for service losses, but will put food on the table and could also be able to sell that they put more money. The more these kind of actions and thinking of socioeconomic empowerment of communities is put at the forefront, because we cannot stop disasters, we can only prepare for them and respond. Because the changing climate is already such that we will see more of these cyclones, we'll see more of hurricanes, we'll see more of droughts, we'll see more of floods. Right. And so socioeconomic empowerment 
becomes the central stage. Doesn't that worry you then if we, if according to you, we see more of these cyclones and we see more of these torrential rains? Is this the end of coastal communities and perhaps even tourism for many people who love to lounge by the sea and have a great time on holidays? Is, is this it? There are solutions that can be able to be put in place. For example, we we'll talk about mangroves that could actually be able to reduce windshield, can be able to protect not just coastal communities, but actually even act as harbors for fisheries that are providing livelihoods for millions of coastal communities. That is one. We talk about wetlands that actually are proven to be more than effective and actually reduces cost by 1.5 million US dollars in terms of artificial infrastructure. So this natural infrastructure, if they are actually not only invested in, but also protected, we are going to see that even though the cyclones are going to hit, the sheer falls and sheer wind and the destruction will be minimized and communities will be protected. But let's not forget mm. that the vulnerability of communities with a changing climate, rising sea levels, in addition to cyclones, as well as hurricanes, are going to be at stake. And what does this mean? It means that in addition to rehabilitating coastlines and making sure that mangroves and wetlands are actually rehabilitated and strengthened, we still need to look at diversification, which is to look at alternatives that these communities can be able to embark on. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, with a changing climate and where we are already at a global community at 1.1 degree, with Africa warming faster and Southern African region warming faster, and with every degree translating to 7% precipitation, there, there are going to be losses, both in terms of life and even the beauty of our coastlines. Excellent contribution. Thank you so much, Mr. Richard Monang, the Deputy Director of the UN Environment Program in Africa. Thank you for speaking to Africa Matters. And now we head to the Horn of Africa region, which is feeling the heat of one of the longest and most severe droughts. Getting enough food is obviously a priority. But access to health care is also a huge challenge. Victoria, I understand you visited a project that's trying to change that. Yes, Adesewa, I went to Turukana to see how people there are using what they call community pharmacy boxes that enables health volunteers to treat people close to their homes. Kenya's Turukana County is among the regions hardest hit by the prolonged drought. Access to health care in these counties' remote areas is often difficult. But Save the Children Kenya has created containers popularly known as community pharmacy boxes to treat some illnesses at home. It has helped a lot because it reduces the movement of people going to the hospitals. Now they can get medicine very close to them. They are happy and so are we because we used to have to refer them to hospitals daily. The health workers have set up outreach programs every fortnight in the communities. Ewoi Erpan, a mother of three, has brought her children for treatment. She says one died last year. The child was sick. The only problem we faced was the distance to the health facility. He died while we were taking him there. Government data estimates about one million children under the age of five in these regions are severely malnourished, and some pregnant and lactating women lack enough food. This is purely a mobile clinic where we have all the services. We do uh, the antenatal care for pregnant mothers. We do immunization for children. Uh, we do treatment for, for, for malnutrition. We have two categories of malnutrition, a child who is severely malnourished. We have a child who is moderately malnourished. A child who is very malnourished is at the verge of dying. At least 4.3 million people in Kenya are in need of humanitarian assistance, according to the National Disaster Management Authority. And the drought is projected to continue. So the state has resorted to seeking help internally in a campaign dubbed Wakenya Tulindani, meaning Kenyans let's take care of each other in Swahili. We are going to be appealing and working with Kenyans in terms of raising awareness around the drought, but also seeing how you can come in and support in feeding a family or community. It takes 3,000 shillings to feed a family for one month, but you can also um, support with smaller 
uh, amounts, every shilling counts. The Horn of Africa is facing an exceptionally persistent drought that is putting pressure on the already constrained resources. And the drought in Kenya shows the human face of the climate crisis in a nation whose people contribute less than 0.1% of global greenhouse emissions. Kenyans are bearing more than their share and they need support urgently now and into the future. Victoria Amunga, Africa Matters, Turkana, Kenya. To South Africa next, which is also battling an environmental disaster, the water hyacinth. One of the world's most invasive freshwater weeds is causing havoc in rivers. Scientists have been using insects which feed on the plant to stop its spread, but they say it's only treating a symptom of a much bigger problem. Claire Harriot reports. The broad leaves and delicate purple flowers might look pretty, but these water hyacinths are a nuisance, suffocating rivers. The waters of South Africa's Hartebeersport Dam are covered in them. Botanists attribute the spread to pollution flowing from cities upstream, like Johannesburg and Pretoria. Water hyacinth is the symptom of pollution. So the reason that it's, it, it invades systems is because there's an increase in nitrates and phosphates, which are essentially fertilizer that allows the plant to grow. So a system like Hardebeersport Dam is probably one of the most polluted systems in, in South Africa, potentially Africa, in that the amount of nitrates and phosphates in the water are higher than anywhere else. And when these invasive species block sunlight from reaching a river, it causes problems. A lack of oxygen in the water damages its quality and seriously affects its ecosystem. Water hyacinth create a favourable breeding ground for mosquitoes that cause diseases like malaria. And the weeds reduce bird populations because a blanket of water hyacinth means birds can't find fish. Tourism is also affected, with tour boats unable to operate. In the last month, it has closed the business down. So we've lost all our business bar one boat. Um, as you can see, the boats are standing, but they aren't going anywhere, there's no passengers. These insects, known as water hyacinth plant hoppers, are being released thousands at a time. The plant hoppers feed on sap, piercing the leaves and damaging the plant cells, which causes the weed to rot. Environmentalist Patrick Ganda rears the insects. He hopes eradicating the water hyacinth will bring back the bird watchers. What used to bring people here used to be the number of birds that they expect to see around here. So since the, arri the arrival of the water hyacinth, uh, we've lost a number of birds. Experts agree the insects are treating a symptom, not the cause. And what's needed is tougher regulation on wastewater management. Claire Herriot, Africa Matters. And to Uganda now, where a former tour guide has created a large boat made from recycled plastic bottles that appeals to locals and foreigners alike. He hopes to end littering and encourage recycling in Africa's largest lake. Rupert Stone reports. An unusual approach to recycling in Uganda. A former Uganda tour guide has built a boat named Floating Island in Lake Victoria using at least 10 tonnes of plastic bottles. James Katiba started constructing the boat in 2017. It also serves as a restaurant and bar. Uh, the vessel is uh, anchored uh, using uh, cords uh, attached to the mainland. Um, it's sitting on, um, on uh, a minimum of 10 tons of plastic bottles. It could hold up to about 100 to 120 people in comfort. The colourful boat has gone down well with locals. We have not been having this opportunity all this while. We had formerly a beach, but uh, due to water activities, um, it got busted. So we started traveling to other areas where we could get some recreation. But when this brother of ours came and opened this floating island, that's when we started getting the news. We started coming in. We were first few guys. It was like some small tent for gathering uh, guys to come and tell stories what. Then later started bringing more impact, and we felt uh, our area, something, a development of this nature that, that had come, we need to be part of it. Katiba paid fishermen to collect plastic bottles which anchor the boat. They are also encrusted with dirt, which is proving a fertile place for plants to grow. 
Floating island also attracts tourists. He has big island actually, but I never heard anything like this in Africa. Special that you know you're using the bottles which are collected from the Lake of Victoria. Yes, which is a you know big plus because you're not only cleaning the environment, but also you know you're providing something unique, very unique. Such efforts are urgently needed in Lake Victoria, which suffers from severe pollution, including plastic waste. Uh, bottles uh, get into Lake Victoria from runoff water, like when it rains. Most, most, most times, actually, it's runoff water that's not properly managed from, uh, from the mainland. They end up in the lake. And um, at, at times, people, you know, just throw them, you know, carelessly, as, as they do. They go to their day-by-day -day, uh, uh, work. Thanks to Floating Island, Uganda has a boat which is not only enjoyable and attractive, but environmentally friendly, too. Rupert Stone... Africa matters. After a week-long traditional mourning period for Christine Atsu, the Ghanaian footballer, in his home country of Ghana, they bid farewell to the former Newcastle winger at a state funeral in the capital, Accra. The 31-year-old last played for Turkish football club Hatay Spor before his untimely demise during February's earthquakes that devastated parts of the country. Isaac Kaleji was there and brings us the story. Ghanaians from all walks of life, including the country's president, Nane Kufuado, paying their final respects to Christian Achu, who died along with so many others in the Turkia earthquakes. News of his death made headlines in Ghana and beyond, and an outpouring of grief followed. Today's state funeral and burial honor a bright life cut short. Much of the tributes read for the 31-year-old were celebratory. Internationally renowned and appreciated football star, Christian Atu was a good father and husband. He was also a kind-hearted philanthropist who touched the hearts and souls of many Ghanaians. 84 million strong Turkish nation loved him. His Excellency President Recep Tayyip Erdogan of the Republic of Turkey express condolences on behalf of the people of Turkey. Achu played for some notable clubs in Europe, including FC Porto, Newcastle United and Everton, with his final signing being Hatta Spore. Christian Achu was known for his skill as a footballer, but the outpouring of grief from mourners at his funeral was about more than just his performance on the page. His humanitarian work in poor, vulnerable communities and him a loyal fan base in Ghana. He has a very good character in terms of how he socialized with people, how he talk with people, and everything about him I think is exceptional. And I like him so much. Even hearing he was dead, I didn't believe it. I didn't believe he's dead. He has done many things for people in the country, also. He has also helped the nations as well. And we know a lot of people, he has been helping them as well. So Achu is someone who's a very serious person in life, also great person, great legend. These young footballers from his former academy, Cheetah FC, are training hard. Shafiru Bako coached Achu when he started his football career here. He says Achu's success serves as an inspiration for the younger footballers. Some of the boys, they are working with what I to tell them. And today, some of them achieve something. And some of them too are picking up what I to told them. And I don't want to talk too much. I to pass away. I feel bad. And may he rest in peace. Achu may be gone. But for many of these world wishes, he won't be forgotten anytime soon. Isaac Kaleji, Africa Matters, Accra, Ghana. Staying in West Africa, this week we explore Yamusukro, a city in South Central Ivory Coast. It is the country's official capital, although the parliament and all government ministries are in the main commercial city of Abidjan. It's also home to the Basilica of Our Lady of Peace, which is listed as the world's largest Christian church by the Guinness World Records. Please have a look.
And that's our show for this week. Please continue to share your thoughts and suggestions about the stories you've seen on this episode or ideas on what you would like us to cover on Twitter using the hashtag Africa Matters. Feel free to reach out to me on my personal handle at Adeshawa Josh. You can watch this episode and more on YouTube. Just search Africa Matters TRT World. Like, comment, and continue to share. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next week.